Priscilla Barrera with the Investing News Network and here with me today is Howard Klein, founder of RK Equity, author of the Lithium Ion Newsletter and also of the Lithium Podcast, Lithium Rocks. Howard, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. So, right. so we're here at PDAC. Uh, we're entering the month of March, the last one of the first quarter of the year. What have been some of the trends you've seen so far in 2019 in the lithium space? Uh, the major trend in the lithium space is mm. that uh, demand is going up and demand forecasts are going up, and particularly mm. from the majors. So Albemarle, Livent, and uh, SQM uh, are all now at about a million tons in 2025 estimate. Albemarle is, has increased that, you know, or potentially upside to 1.2 or 1.3 million. And supply has been slower, right? So there's been rain in South America mm -hmm. and that it has impacted or Cobre. Um, it has impacted to some extent Albemarle. Uh, SQM said it didn't impact them. However, their forecast production or sales for this year of only 50,000 uh, for 2019 is only marginally higher than 2018. And the market had thought or they had articulated to the market that they might be producing as many as 70,000 tons from there. So you're having increased demand and decreased supply and demand expectations are now in the 17, 20, 20% 20 plus range, but production has only been, you know, like 10% up. So demand is exceeding supply and that translates into, you know, in my opinion, higher prices sometime sooner. All right, so in your most recent uh, newsletter, uh, you wrote a little bit about Alba Marle. Can you tell our audience whether you're bullish on this company or not and why? I am bullish Albemarle mm -hmm. for all of the um, you know discourse has been somewhat negative about Albemarle over the past year in, in, in a similar way that uh, you know there are a lot of naysayers on Tesla mm -hmm. and but Tesla continues to perform Albemarle has had nine straight quarters of uh, EBITDA growth uh, they haven't really missed a, you know a, a beat they've been very aggressive in their uh, volume growth through partnering with Mineral Resources. I think that is a, a good transaction in or as a reflection of responding to customer demand, right? Mm -hmm. So Japanese customers, Korean customers, American customers, German customers, uh, you know, have big demands and they want to rely on the bigger companies, you know, to deliver, right? So they're less comfortable often partnering with you know junior you know single project mm -hmm. companies so there was an opportunity uh, with a good asset uh, a large asset in a safe jurisdiction Australia with a good partner in mineral resources who understand how to mine lithium and they've done so with Mount Marion for a while and uh, it's a proven region Pilbara and Altura are in that region and Albemarle has chemical processing skills so this is, is a large asset which is scarce in this mm -hmm. industry to have such a, a large asset and they're responding right with the, the the industry needs investment and this is the biggest company in the industry and they are uh, they've done a good thing right by responding with significant investments whereas some of their uh, partners you know Tangshi has invested four billion dollars in SQM and that's not going to result in any additional supply SQM is investing, you know, in their own assets, mm -hmm. but the growth there is slow. And yeah, they've made in investments, but of a, a much more conservative nature, I think, in in Kidman. And Livent is only now a full spinoff. We'll see what they do, but the growth that they've articulated uh, is not fast enough to meet the demand. Right? Their market share is going to to decrease. So I, I commend Albemarle for uh, making some bold, you know, investments, which I think the market will uh, recognize as, as smart over time and uh, and the valuation of the company is no longer uh, you know very very high so mm -hmm. I do think that Albemarle is a, is a good stock that you know it, it's the it's the proxy it's lithium proxy I don't think we could have um, significant rally in the overall sector unless you have leadership from the most investable companies in the you know, the non-Chinese world, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So from an American, North American investor perspective, Almol and Livent, you know, NYSE listed companies, uh, I think are both uh, worthy of investment at 
these price levels and given their articulated growth plan and, and quality management and, and product. All right, and just staying with uh, the major producers, you did mention Livent. What are your thoughts on that company so far, at least this year? Uh, I've, I've written a lot about mm -hmm. Livent, and I like, you know, they're a hydroxide leader. Um, they have been part of FMC, which is, uh, you, you know, it, it, was, it was not uh, an important part of the FMC business for a long time. So mm -hmm. now that it is fully 100% spun off, they can course their own direction. Uh, they're the fifth largest. You know, I think it's a good base, uh, 20 to 21,000 tons, profitable. Uh, it's in Argentina. You know, they've been in that space for 20 years. So we'll see if they can, uh, you know, grow their production as much as they say. Uh, I like that they're likely to invest in their Bessemer City plant in North Carolina. So it, uh, I'm always. Uh, cheering of uh, investments in the United States, mm -hmm. so it's, it's good that they're likely to, to be doing that. But I think they're, they're, what their strategy ultimately is going forward outside of their current asset in Argentina is, is something very much to, to watch in 2019. All right, and just uh, moving and looking over to the juniors, um, I feel like everybody that is watching us today knows about the Namaska Lithium News. They announced a shortfall in their financing for their mine. What are your thoughts on that situation? And I guess the question is looking ahead, uh, where will money come um, to finance all these Lithium Juniors going forward? Uh, so I've come to learn that uh, Tangshi in Quinana, mm -hmm. right, are building a, a two trains of 24,000 tons, so 48,000 tons they announced was going to cost $700 million. I understand that that's uh, over budget, you know, and not on time, and people I'm talking to are saying that that may be a billion dollars, not 700 million. So cost overruns, even by proven operators, are happen all the time, mm -hmm. and they happen, you know, big companies in mining. So, yes, a 280 million U.S., 375 million Canadian cost overrun, especially as early in the process as it, uh, you know, in construction as it was, came as a as a surprise. I think the reaction to that surprise was overdone. Mm -hmm. um, I believe. Quebec is a great jurisdiction, you know, in the world to mine. I believe the world needs, it's a good mine. Wabuchi, no one questions, is a good mine. Uh, the fact that they have 20 samples from their phase one plant in the hands of customers of high quality battery grade hydroxide when there's a lot of produced product out there that is not meeting battery grade spec is a testament to their, to their process. So I believe that Wabuchi, you know, or and hopefully Shawinigan hydroxide should be part of the supply lithium global lithium supply mix because we're going to need it for the mm -hmm. shortage that I mentioned earlier. Where the financing is going to come from, I hope SoftBank steps up as a major mm -hmm. shareholder. They have you know endless amounts of money. Japanese you know uh, venture capital investor. I'm curious to see what happens with LG Chem. Mm -hmm. LG Chem has an offtake but haven't invested directly. They also have an offtake in Kidman, MOU, but they did invest in Ganfeng. So uh, those are important uh, to me. But I wonder if some of the German OEMs or some of the US OEMs who have had a lot of time to look at a lot of projects over the past couple of years uh, have gotten up to speed enough to say, you know what, this is a good jurisdiction, it's a good pro right, will provide the financing. So we'll see. They've appointed Clarkson Plateau, the Nordic uh, group that led their Nordic bond. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to be seen, but I, I'm certainly wishing them well. I think uh, North American supply in Quebec, also in North Carolina, I think, as you know, we've spoken before, um, I, I think is, has great potential and, and some of the other, you know, in, in, in Nevada uh, mm -hmm. and elsewhere in America. I think Simon Moore has recently spoke to the Senate mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think it's, it's, it's very important um, mm -hmm. that the non-Chinese world kind of gets their act together and, and kind of understands that projects like this need to get funded and there are very high returns. I mean, the, the, the prize at Namaska, if they could produce 30,000 tons at three, four, even $5,000 cost at a 
sales price of twelve, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars, they should be making two hundred, three hundred million dollars of cash flow. If you put a live event multiple on that, anywhere between ten and fifteen times, it's a two and a half, three billion dollar company. It's a two hundred and fifty million dollar company today. So an equity investor looking at whether or not they should participate in a financing, um, you know, there's a very big prize mm -hmm. uh, to fund now as opposed mm -hmm. to funding at a dollar, you know, a year ago. Right. And some will say there's some sort of negative sentiment right now in the market. For those investors that are still betting on lithium as, as a potential investment, what should be their approach right now? I have believed for a long time and I continue to believe that lithium is largely a one-way bet. There is mm -hmm. just a demand shock unlike any other commodity to a market which is very small. So Albemarle Live and SQM, a million tons, that is consensus. Morgan Stanley still has 641 million tons, I'm sorry, 641,000 tons as their 2025 forecast. I think that's aggressively conservative, right, and outlier, right? So if, if the market was 275,000 tons last year, going to a million within six years, and that's just the beginning, right? You know, the, we're talking about eight to 10 percent penetration in 2025. If you believe in 30, 40, 50 percent penetration by 2030, 2040, the world needs to be financing and constructing many, many, many more mines uh, now than in order to, to meet that supply. So in my approach, I have in my lithium ion bull and lithium ion rocks, I'm talking about it, you know, the Mr. Market scoreboard, there's about 30 companies there. I would allocate 60 to 65% in big cat names like Albemarle and Livent, Ganfeng and Mineral Resources. I would allocate, you know, 20% to companies like Aura Cobre, um, you know, perhaps funded companies or, or advanced companies or partnered companies like Kidman, and then probably another 20 or 25% allocation to some of the juniors. And I have a preference for jurisdictionally for uh, you know safe jurisdictions. I have a preference for hard rock. So I've mentioned these names before, like Piedmont mm -hmm. and Savannah, you know, Sigma in Brazil. Um, I've also come to understand you know, lithium power in Chile. It's the private side of Chile. So I, I like these are some of the names that I'm looking at, but taking a basket approach, you don't need to buy 10 companies, but you're probably, you should allocate money to the space. You may even want to allocate money to one of the ETFs. There's the LIT or the BATT, uh, but I believe lithium is a one-way bet with a, you know, three, five, and longer time horizon, because if the market's going to grow three or four times, you know, Albemarle is going to grow its EBITDA, you know, mm -hmm. should grow its EBITDA three or mm -hmm. four times, and therefore, it, you know, it, it could be a triple mm -hmm. um, from here over a period of time. If you had invested in Albemarle around the time of the Rockwood acquisition, and you sold it, you know, this time last year at, at 140, you were up, you know, over 100%, right, in three years. Mm -hmm. It's come in about 40% from there, but again, I believe the Mineral Resources Joint Venture is a, is a good idea. And I think that stock could triple over, um, you know, a three to four year time frame. And I think the juniors could be up five or ten times. Right. And uh, what do you think are some of the factors investors should keep an eye on for the rest of the year that could impact the lithium space? Um, just watch each quarter results. Just mm -hmm. watch the demand side. Mm -hmm. we'll watch. Tesla, what happens? Watch what happens with the China trade um, discussions with mm -hmm. the United States. I believe a deal is relatively soon going to happen. America won't get everything it wants. There'll be some sort of compromise, but I think there'll be a relief that uh, uh, for, where there's been an overhang in the market. I think this might be good, not just in the lithium space, but commodities broadly. I think commodities as a sector are significantly underweight by most investors. So even if you, do, if you move from underweight to neutral, you, know, you can have a boom in, in copper and nickel and it's just gonna be an alloc asset allocation to commodities. But again, I think lithium will get you know, caught up in, in that. I think the third year of presidential cycles tend to be good. You know, mm -hmm. election years are more complicated. So I, I'm quite bullish. US economy is doing great, 
unemployment's very low, inflation's relatively low, the Fed is on hold. So there's a lot of ingredients for there to be risk on in America, uh, the trade war being the biggest kind of overhang. So once that's out of the way, I then think the fundamentals of lithium, the, the overhang, the, the, the oversupply narrative uh, promoted by Morgan Stanley has now been very discredited, in my opinion. And I, in the last Lithium Ion Rocks podcast, uh, I, I go into great detail uh, as to why. All right, then. So my final question for you, uh, since you're bringing it up, you started this podcast uh, recently. Why? Why a post podcast? Why now? Um, well, podcasting has become increasingly popular, as mm -hmm. I understand. It's like uh, early days of radio. Mm -hmm. um, I've started to listen to some podcasts. I wasn't a big podcast listener, but I feel that uh, the financial community, I, I say my target is this person I, I call Jane or Joe Battery Pack, mm -hmm. right? Not Joe Six Pack, not an uneducated person, but someone, a self-directed, you know, maybe it's, he owns a Tesla, or mm -hmm. maybe he owns Tesla stock. He understands this disruptive thematic that's happening in the transportation sector and also the utility sector. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to figure out how to play it. So my audience is that investor, and making him or her understand the connection is like, you could have invested in 1920 in any one of 300 automakers, right? Or, you know, a half dozen or a dozen oil companies. You would have been better off investing in the upstream fuel for mm -hmm. the internal combustion engine economy, right? I'm recommending investing in the upstream fuel, mm -hmm. which is lithium for the lithium ion battery, which is fueling, you know, this disruption of transportation and utilities. So I, I, I feel that the market needs greater education. The financial investor needs more financial analysis, not just industry analysis, but financial analysis. And to understand what I just said, allocate some money to the sector, and we'll talk about specific companies and their projects and their managements and the challenges that they'll go through, like Namaska. But the reward is is very good for someone who has a, a long-term view. I find retail investors have a much longer-term view than the very rapid trading uh, mentality that we witness here in. Toronto in particular, mm -hmm. right? So people are lamenting, why is it so volatile here in Toronto? You only have Namaska and, and Lithium Americas as meaningfully sized stocks, and the rest are you know, speculative mm -hmm. you know, juniors, and they're off the cannabis last year, right? So th it's a very fleeting um, mentality. So I, I've, I've, we're targeting, first and foremost, a sophisticated Jane mm -hmm. and Joe battery pack, but also, a sophisticated kind of family office or C-suite lithium you know, executive or an, a, a genuine active fund manager who runs a hundred million, two hundred and fifty million dollar fund who could actually move the needle of his fund with allocating money to, to the space which will have super normal returns relative to what's available in, uh, you know, in, in other investment sectors. All right, Howard, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Priscilla. Once again, I'm Priscilla Barrera with the Investing News Network, and here with me today was Howard Klein, founder of RK Equity, author of the Lithium Iron Boom newsletter, and now host of the Lithium Iron Rocks podcast.